The tragedy of Karbala, if we go back hundreds of years, we see that a group of people from the family of Hazrat Muhammad wasallam, sacrificed themselves, sacrificed each other in the name of truth, for upholding the truth and for maintaining and for, for, uh, for the religion uh, that uh, their grandfather established for the generations to come. Today we're going to talk about that and what it symbolizes, the tragedy of Karbala, in this society, in the previous societies, and for all societies to come. And to discuss that today, we have a panel of guests with us. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Aslam Khaki with us. Uh, he's a jurist, he's a scholar, so thank you very much for joining us today in this very important discussion. And uh, then our second guest today is Dr. Rao Nadeem Alam. He teaches at Qaeda Azam University and he's also an anthropologist. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. And our third guest today, who is uh, our panelist, is Professor Dr. Sayed Imtiaz Ali Rizvi. Uh, he has been teaching uh, religious education in Kumb, and right now he's supervising a research journal on religion and social values and also he's basically a specialist in theology so thank you very much for joining us today. Now, um, Dr. Khaki, uh, we speak of the tragedy of Karbala every year. We see a lot of programs, we see uh, a lot of people lamenting that what happened in Karbala should not have happened perhaps. But I see that Perhaps it was meant to be for upholding the truth and uh, uh, for for the religion of the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him. Now, what I'd like to ask you is the basic philosophy behind the happening of Karbala, behind the tragedy of Karbala. Yeah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. There is no cable to the preposition that the tragedy of Karbala is one of the most tragic events in the history of not only the Muslim history, rather in the history of the mankind. But I see it on otherwise, that the tragedy of Karbala has happened to help the humanity. Right. How to raise the vice and what are the steps which should be adopted when you say the tyranny or oppression in the society, directly speaking. Just putting aside the history, the events. Tragedy of Karbala, Karbala is not an event only. Rather, it is a movement for accomplishment of some mission, which mm. was the mission of the Hazrat Imam Hussain. Indeed, it was the mission of the Holy Prophet, mission of Islam, right. implemented through the family of Hazrat Imam Hussain. This is on record. Imam Hussain, Hazrat Imam Hussain just moved this movement in the environment, political environment of Yazid, when the democratic system of government set by the Holy Prophet, that was the Shorayat consultation, was just taken back, uh, was taken, just put into the paradigm of the tyranny, of the destiny, just after Muawiyah, there was Yazid, that it was holding as a destiny. Imam Hussain wanted to put it back. It's wrong to say that he wanted himself to be the uh, caliph, otherwise there was no reason there that you are challenging the dynasty of some you know, uh, person and then you are again the candidate for that. He didn't put himself even as a candidate for the caliphate. Exactly, he was yes. challenging the system, not giving himself an opportunity. Though he was fit, the most fit person for that post, but it was the then put to the public or to the uh, company at that time, it was the target that it would be put back to the people to choose it, but first to eradicate that evil which was their uh, uh, undemocratic government, dynasty government. The measures he has adopted were well, number one is, and this is the same philosophy and the message, to raise the voice. Don't right. be 
द साइलेंट मेजारटी वो इसे दैट द साइलेंट मेजारटी एज कुरान से वमालकुम ला तो कातलफ़ी सबील वमुस्तफ़ी नमिन रिजालिसाखर दैट वट्स हैपन विद यू वट्स रॉन्ग विद यू दैट यू आर नॉट जस्ट रेजिंग यूर वॉइस आर नॉट जस्ट गोइंग फॉर द वॉर और फॉर द रजिस्टेंस वैन द पीपल वीक पीपल द वीमेन एंड द चिल्ड्रन दे आर क्राइंग इन दैट टेरिटरी दैट वो गॉड आल माइटी जस्ट टेक आउट Uh, uh, take us out of these oppressor people and right, oppressed sir, talking about village. talking about raising the voice now mm. um uh, mr raunadeem alam sir uh, we're talking about raising our voice for righteousness for the truth but today when we talk about our society we don't see that happening like dr khaki very beautifully said a uh, silent majority that's what we're witnessing these days isn't that it <coughs> uh, partially uh, you're right uh we have a silent majority uh because upholding truth is quite daring exactly and if you look retrospective uh, perspective uh, we often ignored the dyad it wasn't always uh hussein but it was uh, preceded by hassan who was the fifth caliph right and then he forgo his uh, right of the caliphate so uh, there is always for this silent majority the first step is negotiating giving space to the opponent or the contestants then we come to this contestation then there must be contestation uh, because there is always uh, evil and the uh, uh, righteous people around us so first of uh, uh, first of all the righteous people need to give space ask them to negotiate so that is the first step so maybe the what what we call uh, silent majority is in that phase that is possible then uh, the intel- intelligentsia uh, where hussein is the symbol of intellect uh, that comes in and uh, that is uh, the symbolic value of hussein for us for the intelligentsia of the country or the globe uh, who needs to negotiate with this silent majority to bring them forth and remember that uh, there is another latent message in kabbala that even if the intelligentsia comes forth they won't have enough followers so they'll exactly. be defeated exactly. so be ready be, be prepared for that and you have to come forward and then might be uh, you will be the alone person standing for the truth and then you are sacrificing your belonging your progeny yourself that and that is quite strong uh, or the like the highest message we get from kabbala so if someone is ready from this silent majority they need to be intellectually uh, stronger than the rest they need to be stronger in their faith they need to be stronger in willingness to sacrifice themselves or the highest forms of sacrifice uh, and uh, if you see around you all the leaderships even in the non muslim world they always uh, replicated this message so uh, for me uh, willingness is the primary thing then uh, the prerequisite is intellect and faith and third thing is action uh, where you might have followers you might not have followers but then once you are determined you uh, never uh, step back if you right forward. exactly and uh, um, uh, mr rizvi I mean we know that a group of 72 people against a huge majority and we're talking about a silent majority here people who wouldn't really listen people who wouldn't really be convinced very easily whereas this group of people went against everyone to uphold the faith to uphold the truth I mean how was this possible so much dare in people there was so much courage in those people where did that come from bismillah rahman rahim <clears throat> actually this uh, comes with the faith and the manners and the teachings of islam what uh, they taught to them uh, this uh, karbala happened uh, when uh, uh, yazid asked for the bay or bait or endorsement of his activities so actually uh, imam hussain al islam was uh, in medina that time when yazid uh, was succeeded and he came in power so he, he asked him to come forward and endorse his activities yes what he is doing that means he is on in power so it's not just like vote 
what we call bay'a in the literature or bayat in Urdu, what we call it. So it is actually endorsement of everything. That was a wrong Can thing. That was wrong thing, especially the succession. That was wrong. That means uh, there should be a system in which we should elect the, you see, the rulers. And it was not there. And there was a treaty between, as he said, the fifth caliph, uh, we say Imam Hassan, mm -hmm. alayhi salam, and between the father of Yazid, Muawiyah, uh, Ibn Abi Sufyan. So there was a treaty between them. And that treaty, one was one clause of that treaty was that they will not, in, uh, they will not announce or they will not nominate any person as his successor. So that clause was, you see, was not followed, and even not followed that time again. Imam Hussain al-Islam has said nothing, but they asked him to endorse it also. So uh, his, he and his followers what you said, someone to two people, hmm. they said, we will not endorse it. This was the main cause and the main reason uh, which uh, led to this uh, tragedy of uh, Karbala. Exactly. So uh, yeah. that means standing for the, you see, cause, standing for the rules, standing for the, you see, a democracy or the system or the constitution even. You see, the uh, father of Yazid, he was 20 years, he was in power. That time, Imam Hussain al-Islam was there. So he lived in his rule. But he never said something because there was a treaty. Right. And Quran says, Awfu bil aqood, when you made a treaty, so you have to follow it. And you know, uh, Prophet Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he also followed and he obeyed the rules. Absolutely. Al fuzul is there and... You see, Sula Hadebiya is there yes. specially. So he makes uh, treaties and he follows the treaties. The same uh, thing they followed. But when you are overruling the things, so th you must stand for it. No, oh, absolutely, that's correct. Now, uh, Dr. Khaki, I'd like to ask you, why is it that uh, perhaps in, it's in the human nature that falsehood is always easy to follow and it's always very, very difficult to stand up for the truth, or even speak truth for that matter, let alone stand up. <clears throat> As it is just in the nature that it is very easy to swim in the tide, in the direction of the tide of the river, but very difficult to go, you know, swim against the tide hmm. of waves of the river. So it is the same. In the society, you have to face and make a sacrifice for standing for the truth. And it is a history, whosoever went for the cause of the truth, he was persecuted. So this is the nature of the man, because persecution is for the, the speaking truth. So as far as this Karbala tragedy is concerned, one child last year, he was asking me, he was very much moved by the Karbala tragedy and the story, it was just being uh, told. He wept with, you can say, the tears. And that child, hardly he was 12 years old, he asked me, that when it was happening, why did Allah Almighty not come to the help of his, the grandson and the family of the, his, the dear Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Why didn't he come to the help? That was a very I mean, embarrassing question. Then I just, whatever I could reply, I said that it was a must. Mm -hmm. This tragedy was a blessing for the mankind as you say that the people say ke shaheed ki jo maut hai wo qawm ki hayat hai for the life of the uh, people or the nation it was must that should, should be sacrificed you can't just see any example in the history whether it is at the individual level or at the national level that the people have gone up or elevated without any sacrifice number one uh, number two was which i could just make up that point i said that the God wanted to give a role model to the humanity. The Prophet gave the role model how to live the life, how to live. Hussein gave the model how to die. So it was the completion of the life of, or the mission of that. Because had there been no role model, I would have said, I, I always say, that if there has been no role model of Imam, there, perhaps there would have been no democratic country in the Muslim world. 
because all the Muslim world democratic has come through the resistance to the monarchy, resistance to the dynasty, resistance to the kingship. They take the inspiration and the role model by that Imam Hussain rose against such things. Why can't we? We are the follower. So that gives empowerment, that gives you inspiration and stand. Without that, you can't do it. You can't inspire the people through only speeches. Oh, you should move against the tyranny as it is happening in Palestine or Kashmir. You can't give it only by speeches, but by referring to the role model. That's why the Prophet Hasana, that the Prophet is the role model. That's why the prophets are sent. Otherwise, the book was enough. Quran should have been sent through angels and just given to the people to read it out and to follow it. But there was no role model. So the prophets come to behave like a role model. So this tragedy was must. It was needed, rather I would say more needed. It was tragedy on the event. But as far as mission is concerned, it was a blessing. Right. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Ranadim, like you said, a role model has always been a must, it has always been a necessity, but despite that we see today's society, uh, we see a lot of selfishness, we see a lot of uh, uh, the typical sentence that we hear, <coughs> why me, right? And uh, that kills all the spirit of sacrifice. We don't see it, this, the spirit of sacrifice which is very common these days. We see why me, we see what's in it for me, we see I have my life and I will lead it the way I want to, regardless of the people who are attached to you or the people who can be affected positively by perhaps one of your sacrifices. Well, uh, let me relate it to the previous point uh, raised by Khaki Saib in the beginning, that uh, swimming in the tide is quite difficult. And there he uh, resembled the tide with evil or the bad forces. So let's switch the positions. Why don't you be the tide, the righteousness be the tide? And then once you uh, use the different lens uh, in nurture and in training of your youth, that will change the things, first of all. That you have to tell them that speaking truth is right, uh, rather easier because if you speak lie, you have to remember it. When you speak truth, you don't have to remember it. You don't it. have to remember so it. So that, that, that's the position. So change the lens, change the position. That will change the, uh, like the vision of your youth and the people. So once you change this uh, lens or the position, that will ultimately uh, make the selfish people more sacrificing. Because then you have to uh, nurture them. Why not me? Hmm. And uh, replicating may make them mimic the event of Kabbalah, where the protagonist of the event is the guy who is saying, why not me? And then he finds his happiness in sacrificing himself. Because the epitome of uh, your luck as a Muslim is citing the creator. That is the mirage. That is the epitome of your exactly. happiness. So when you teach your youth uh, this vision or this position, that will transform their, their cognition. So once we hit the cognition, and uh, as Rizwi Saab is going to uh, plan the schooling and the education, so this might be the position uh, what he must take for the youth and the next generation. So that will change. And uh, as far as practicing uh, righteous, selfless, or sympathetic or empathetic uh, stages in your daily dealings, uh, that might need the law and the regulation. That's what we uh, learn from the Kabbalah once again, as uh, Rizvisav was mentioning the treaties. So that's how we stand by our words. That's how we make our words in black and white. We agree on things, we make laws, and then we follow the laws. And then uh, we think about the legal paradigm as social paradigm. Right. So they, they need to be synchronized. And uh, this is what's happening around us, that our legal paradigm and the social paradigm are in imbalance. So exactly. we need to do that. Once we do that, we need to nurture that among our youth. Absolutely. Now, um, uh, Dr. Rizvi, of course, you uh, specialize in theology. How important is it to instill uh, the spirit of sacrifice in the education system 
because uh, you specialized in theology, but do, do you not think that theology should be a part of all the educational systems? Yes, well, I believe in it. I said, uh, I feel uh, that what we are teaching to our children, uh, that is, we are not uh, giving them the real values. Uh, because we are teaching them history, yeah. but we're not telling them the spirit. Yes, yeah, spirit. We are not telling them the spirit, and we're not telling them the real values, actually. So we are, what I say, we are a confused nation, and especially it emerges from the education system. Actually, from school system, we are giving them a few things. Even what we are t teaching as Islam is not a true Islam, Islamic values. This is a problem, a real problem. For example, you see, for example, morals mm -hmm. or manners, mm -hmm. what we are teaching to, the, to our children that are not real uh, manners of Islam. They are of not Islam. real morals of Islam. We have to stand by. For example, in the books we read something, but when we come to the practice, we are not following it. This is a problem. So why we are not following it? Because we, have not, we are not so brave to stand for it. For example, we have, we have a value which we call isar. Isar means we have to sacrifice, as you said. So, but we are not sacrificing. Even for the charity, if we are doing, we are giving charity as what is surplus for us. But why we are not giving from our own? If, it's our, if we are using very, it something. That's very true. That's yeah. very true. That's yeah. very true. We, we do see that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Khaki, I'd, I'd like to ask you the same question because when we're bringing children up, we don't have any training for the new parents, right? Mm -hmm. Because in, in the psychiatry, they say that every human has a parent, a child in, the, in them, and they carry forward what they have been taught and they yeah. teach that to their children. They do not unlearn and relearn mm -hmm. what they should be doing, right? Mm -hmm. So is that why? we see a lot of selfishness uh, prevailing in the society because uh, in the brought up of children, we don't see the, the spirit of Isar like uh, Sir was mentioning. Yeah. This is what happened in the society, particularly in the undeveloped society, that the children are taking their parents in them, baby parent, we say it. That is the stigma to the parents because they are not doing. That's why there was a... Uh, survey in America that the people, the young generation is getting deterioration. Hmm. They just started preaching Bible and all that to just bring down deterioration down and to just enhance their moral values or inculcate good moral values, but it didn't work. At that time, there was a great psychologist, Lawrence Kohlberg. Mm -hmm. He is called as the moral psychologist. Right. He identified the problem. He said that the parents are not the role models. You can change the habit of the people, uh, your youth, through your role model. You are telling lie and you are asking the, requiring your youth that they should tell truth. You are dishonest and you are required that. So the, he said that you should not even preach to the students. Make the people around them a role model. They should be role model. For the teacher should be role model. The teacher is coming late in the class and he is preaching punctuality and regularity. Parents telling uh, lies and abusing the other and mis behaving, mis uh, misbehaving with their own yani parent, uh, children, uh, sorry, uh, friends or in the relatives, bahu, saas, all this thing. And then teaching to the students, you should behave properly, nicely. So he said that if you want to change or the young generation from or uh, from moral deterioration to the decency, you should change yourself and the models around them. Models are the parents and the teachers and your elders around them, the preachers right. and all that. So the problem is with the old generation, not with the young generation. They are not transmitting the same uh, any the uh, value, Islamic values or decent values to the children. So as far as this Karbala uh, event is concerned or tragedy is concerned, I would not say it the tragedy. If it had failed by its mission, it would have been a tragedy. Yesterday, I was telling my children, and they were saying, Papa, you work hard for 18 years, and you sometimes never feel that you are tired. I said, and sometimes I work for two, three hours, but I feel tired. Where is the problem? Problem is that when, after working 18 hours, I feel some success that I have achieved something. My work has gone according to my mission. I don't feel tiredness. 
I fight as when I fail. I went there and I could not do any program or any class, or it was not a good class for me as far as material. I feel tiredness. So it is the result of your efforts. If your efforts has gone successful, then it was a blessing. So I say the martyrdom, apparently which seems to be a tragedy, it was not a tragedy. It was tragedy for the Yazid that he failed in his mission. Because even Iqbal but, says that yeah. he was a martyr and yeah. he is alive. Why do yeah, you... Shaheed ki jo maut hai, wo qawm ki hayat hai. Lahu jo hai shaheed ka, wo qawm ki zakat hai. Even Quran says, why do you say these martyrs that they are dead? No, they are all alive. They are alive through mission. Not alive in the sense they are sitting around us. They, their mission is alive. Anything. Newton is also alive, though not martyr, due to his invention that people are benefiting. The Madame Curie is alive because the people are using his invention of x-ray and all that. She's alive there. The people have that who has eaten the things and they are in the soil. So I say that the, it is not a, a tragedy. It was the blessing of all God, God Almighty, as some child was asking, that why didn't Allah Almighty interfere and save the grandson of the, and his holy prophet? The answer was simply he wanted to give this blessing by providing a role model to a you that model sacrifice to anything the next generations to come. Had yes. there been no such sacrifice, then everybody would have said in their uh, dance peacefully, saying that, oh, God will help us. We have not to resist. We have not to raise voice. All these voices which are being raised in the society to change the tyranny or against the evil is referred and inspired by this. Blessed, blessed tragedy, I would say, of the Imam. Blessed tragedy, that's correct. So this is. Now, uh, Dr. Rao uh, Nadeem Alam Saab, I mean, uh, we know, I mean, you're an anth anthropologist, right? Anthropologically speaking, um, how important is it to make people understand what Dr. Khaki just said? Because uh, that's something very new for me and something very different coming from somebody because everybody calls it Rame Hussein, everybody calls it tragedy of Hussein, whereas he put it very beautifully by calling it the miracle or the blessedness of the event of Karbala, the happening of Karbala. How would you comment on this? Well, uh, that's human nature that whenever your loved one uh, go away, uh, you start uh, mourning or uh, like you are in grief. And that expression of grief is there in the narrative of Karbala through Sakina. Right. But again, that is uh, the result of mentorship and the parenthood. I, I'm, I'm distinguishing these two things because the parenting was Ali's and uh, his wife's or, or the daughter of uh, the Prophet. The Prophet. But the mentoring was of the Prophet directly. So that is the difference of mentor. Mentor is the role model. Right. And uh, the usual nurture is through parents. So in contemporary society, we need to distinguish these two. And the mentor might be in the schools, or might be in the family, or might be in your neighborhood. So uh, the role models uh, must be uh, located in these two institutions of parents and of mentors. And then uh, once we see uh, through this lens of uh, a joyous event of uh, achieving your mission, so that is very critical and crucial uh, for any learner of history uh, in general because uh, that is very much uh, a right position to think about uh, Karbala not as a tragedy but an uh, event where there is a lot to learn. A lot to learn, absolutely. And why we call it tragedy is the hermeneutic violence. And so, how it all happened, yeah. yes, so that the is way the, it that, that is the hermeneutic violence, what we are uh, learning through the narratives narrated around us. That there is always black and red color into it. Exactly. And then, then there is public mourning. So these things make us think about it as a tragedy. But that tragedy was not uh, for the truth, truthfulness. That was not a tragedy for uprightness. That was not a tragedy for uh, choosing the right path or the mart uh, martyrdom as well. But that was a tragedy for a family. That was a tragedy 
for any human who is embedded into relationships and family. Absolutely. So, so that's that's how we see things, and we isolate all these uh, components of human life. So th that depends on your position. That you see it as tragedy. That is right as well. At times you see it as an accomplishment and a happy moment, and that too is true. So there might be multiplicity of truths in in a singular event, and then uh, the highest epitome of philosophy or life is achieving truth. Know thyself. So Kabbalah is the pathway to knowing to thyself. Knowing yeah. one's so, own so, 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 so if you see it that way, uh, you might be uh, accustomed to grief, but still smiling and being happy. Absolutely. Very so, beautiful. So a concomitant uh, like merger of emotions for me. Absolutely. Now, we'll talk more about uh, the Karbala event, the different perspectives of Karbala, but after a short break, stay tuned. Well, welcome back. You're watching our special Maharam transmission. My name is Fahim Bangash. And uh, now, uh, as we were talking, we were having a discussion on uh, different perspectives of uh, Maharam al-Haram and different perspective of the event of Karbala. Now, I would like to ask uh, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Imtiaz Ali Rizvi Saab, uh, sir, uh, we were having a very interesting discussion on another whole new perspective as far as Karbala is concerned. First of all, I'd like to know your views regarding that. Uh, actually, Dr. Haki has uh, raised a very nice point, and I endorse him. That's not a tra tragedy of Karbala uh, in a bigger sense. And uh, actually, it is a role model for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it institution of Karbala, Dars Gai Karbala. It's an institution which teaches us how to live, how to behave, how to deal with enemy even. You see, when uh, we narrate uh, the story of Karbala, so if you listen what uh, we are narrating there, we are saying how Imam Hussain al -Islam, he talks to their wives, mm -hmm. how he talks to his sister, how he talks to his nephew, how he talks to his uh, children, and even how he talks to his enemies, yes. how he behaves with enemies. And what uh, his, uh, for example, you see, for example, if we say, uh, that means nothing was left for Imam Hussain al -Islam. Even that time he opened the door of dialogue. He talked to them. All have lost, for example, he lost all his, uh, you see, children. He lost all his family members. Still he was talking to them. It's very difficult. It's very it's difficult yes. to, you see, you see. Every time when one person going for war, he has to talk, he comes to the family members, he talks to them, and there we are narrating how they are talking. And even, you see, it's very interesting that everything was, uh, you see, narrated by the enemies. Because they were there, or some people, uh, which were what to call makatil, what is written in the makatil. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And even after that, when they, they were, uh, when uh, you see Mukhtar, he made uh, them prisoners. That time they wrote these stories, everything, what happened there. So you see how he behaves. He gives, uh, you see, water to the animals of uh, enemies. He saw the animals of animals when uh, uh, the, you see the army of uh, Hur, who he was leading the, you see, opponents. At that time he was enemy. Later he became the part yes. of Imam Hussain al-Islam's army. So uh, he said, our animals, they are thirsty. We have no water. So he gave water to them. So in which type of war we have seen this thing? This, no, these are I the manners. Yes, yes, yes. On the so. other side, when you will see the cut, uh, you see water on the human beings, on the family of uh, Imam Hussain al-Islam, on the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So th there was a behavior that uh, uh, on the other side, and that was a behavior on this side. Stop so this is, this is yes. the thing, what we say, this is an institution. We have to learn from it. How we should behave. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, Dr. Khaki, uh, like uh, Mr. Rizvi said, the institution of Karbala, a very uh, nice word that he used yeah. for uh, the event of Karbala, an institution, something to learn from. Yeah. Uh, whereas we see uh, a very huge level of intolerance, not just in this part of the world, in every part of the world. If we talk of today's environment, today's era, we see that everywhere. When we have such institutions in our history books, when we have these things to learn from, why is it that we still have such a huge amount of intolerance? Thank you for the cultural uh, in perspective. If you see, we say that this is the individual habit. Then it goes to the movement. When some people gather and they go for some purpose, that is movement. Then there is institution. If that movement is maintained in the society and the people just work on the same line, then it is the institution. To that extent, the institution is there, institution right. of imams and being recited, practiced, bored and all that. But it has not become the culture. Until, unless you inculcate those values which you have learned from their institution become the part of your life, your own values, your own conduct, it does not become the culture. We lack the an, culture. We have the institution. As Quran says, <laughs> They have the eyes, but they do not see with it. They have exactly. the sight, but they lack insight. We have the sight of all these tra tragic or other institutions where the role models are there. We read the Sirat of the Holy Prophet ﷺ very sacredly. Do everything. Just we mourn and endorse all these things which we are talking, whether it is Karbala or the prophets and all that. We just respect the institution, but we do not accept the institution. We do not accept it in our conduct. We accept it in our lip service. So the need of the time is that we should inculcate those values which are in the institution. We learn from the institution, not only for preaching and teaching, but for inculcating in our own life. Then it would become the culture. Then your question would be answered automatically in the future. One point, another innovative point which I want to raise it, it is not in the books as well because some points I just innovated by thinking and contemplation as I have raised the, uh, the combination of tragedy and the blessing. The word shahada, shaheed, is from the word shahada, shahida shahidu. Mm -hmm. It means to witness, to provide the evidence. Shahid right. is the witness. So this word shaheed comes from the shahada which means providing the evidence. So Shaheed is a person which provides the evidence to the people uh -huh. by sacrificing his life that I was sincere in my mission. You can talk, you can just gossip. I can do that, I can do that. But when the sacrifice is required, you run away. You so run it away. means yeah. you are not sincere with your patient. Imam Hussain and his family provided an evidence by accepting the Shahada, provided the evidence, number one. Number two, he provided the evidence to the order or to the uh, declaration of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Kal Hussain Wal Hussain Minni. Why? A person could ask, why? Because they are your grandsons only. Why you are just pampering your own grandson? The evidence was provided on the day of Karbala that I was just 
pampering them or just blessing them for the reason that they are carrying on my mission and they will prove. So the Karbala tragedy, I say, has proved for all the times to come that the saying of the Prophet was not due to the fact that it was the progeny or the descendants of his uh, you know, the family or his Prophet, but also, also they were entitled for that title. And they, they were entitled, it. yes. And they have proved it. What other sacrifice you can ask from the people than sacrificing their life? Your own life. You can ask for the donation, that is a small sacrifice. For the property to be given, that is also sacrifice. But a person would give his life in the mission when he's very much sincere. So he just, as we say, alam bardar. They were alam bardar of the alam. It was symbolic. It is symbolic. But the mission is the great flag. They were holding the flag of the Holy Prophet like for the mission. Yes. You have to stand against the evils, against the tyranny, against the oppression in the life. And that's the inspiration. So Shahada, evidence, providing the, uh, you know, his sacrifice to the people and justifying his title by the Holy Prophet And it was a travel of peace. That's why he migrated. Otherwise, there was a conflict. He didn't want to be the bloodshed like in Jange Jamal or Jange Safan, in mm -hmm. the Medina, in the city of the Prophet. Yes. So he chose to migrate. And even you say that the great achievements have been made through migration. Johnson Mundela, he migrated from the tyranny. Then they come back, Khomeini right. and all the Even with the Holy Prophet, وسلم, he migrated to Medina. He did. So Absolutely. it is the migration is for the peace purpose. And then he offered to the Yazid and all that for the peace negotiation on the treaty, as my learned friend was referring, the treaty between Muawiyah and the Ali. Let's adhere right, to that. Right, right. And, and, and Dr. Rao Nadim Alam, uh, another question to you, that we do see this. Uh, whenever Muharram comes, people start mourning for Hazrat Imam Hussain and his family and the family of the Prophet. Muharram finishes and we see the same, uh, you know, falsehood, the same tyrannical behavior, the same intolerance. So what is the use of observing that particular month that you tolerate stuff, you speak about that stuff, you read about that stuff, you narrate it to the rest of the world, but as soon as Baharim finishes, your level of tolerance also goes, your spirit of sacrifice also vanishes. Well, uh Routine is always uh, the part of human life. You have a daily routine. Uh, like, for example, you once uh, brush your teeth in the morning, you need to brush them again at night. So, uh, like replicating this annual uh, month of Hurmat, it was Muharram, and then mm -hmm. it was all of a sudden, it was Muharram ul Haram. So, the, the Hurmat of this month, uh, is uh, cannot be replicated the whole year round because it's human nature to have diverse situations, diverse emotions. However, uh, if we uh, refer back to the institutionalization of things and uh, Kabbalah's institution, I see it replicated. It isn't replicated every day, mm -hmm. but often it is replicated. For example, tolerance with the enemies is uh, you you may cite this incidents of Abhinandan. Right. He was set free without any uh, like uh, pay, pay, payment for that. So that is the institution of Karbala which taught us this thing. So there is a continuity of values uh, among us and among our institutions. So we must uh, praise our uh, army for that thing of upholding uh, the values of Karbala. And then again, uh, there is another gendered message, mm -hmm. making a sister head of the household. Mm -hmm. You see the father of the nation. He didn't mention anybody, but there was a sister who yes. was the household, who was taking over. But let's not go into the events of history. But still, I see that there, there, there is a continuity of values of Kabbalah among us, among Pakistanis, among masses, among leadership of Pakistan. So that, I'm, I'm convinced that we have the continuity of those values. Right, and so, uh, um, of course, the, uh, we're running short of time, so right. I'd, I'd uh, definitely like to ask Professor Dr. Rizvi if you could please give a short message at the end of the program. 
Uh, I want to give a message that uh, we should not go or see the Karbala as a rituals activity of rituals. Actually, it's a, it's a thing to learn. And as Imam Hussain al-Islam said, I just quote one uh, word from him, and that was his will, and will which he wrote, and endorsed, and he put his stamp on it. So he said, well, why I, I am going? He said, an urid an amara bil maruf wa anhan il munkar. My will is that, or what I am thinking is that just I want to uh, teach the good things and restrict you from the evils. So the message of Karbala is this. The message of Karbala is we should go forward for the good deeds, good values, good work, and we should stop ourselves from the evils. This is the message of Karbala, and we should follow it. Right. Uh, thank you. And uh, Dr. Khaki, your message at the end of the program. The simple message which emerges from the martyrdom of the Imam is that we should not be the silent uh, member of the society. We should raise the voice against the evils at all the levels according to our own capacity. And we should go for the negotiation first. And if they fail, then if we are weak enough, we should migrate, not just go for that, and at every chance. So it was a movement, you can say, for the resistance against the evils. So we should resist it, as the Holy Prophet said, Man min kumun karan fal Whosoever sees any evil, he should resist it with power. If he likes it, then with the you know, preaching or teaching, and if he like, then he should be taken to the heart only. That is the lowest. Right. So it is the voice. You should raise, jag te rehna, we say. You should be vigilant in the society and not the blind. Absolutely. And uh, Professor? Uh, I guess I cannot pose them. So they both said the same thing. Amr bil maruf munkar. But there is another point to it. Like uh, what he narrated was use of power in the very beginning, use of ants in the very beginning. But Hassan and Hussain taught us to negotiate first, think of bad things in your heart, very first step. So that is more human to, or more closer to nature. Think of bad things bad in your heart, then speak of them as bad things, then if necessary, then take action. So that is more uh, anti-violent uh, Islam, or, or the vision of Islam as anti-violence. Right. Thank you very much, all of you. Dr. Rao and Nadeem Alan Saab, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Aslam Faki, thank you very much for taking our time and talking to us. And uh, finally, uh, Dr. Imtiaz Ali Rizvi, thank you very much for being here. Uh, well, viewers, uh, the event of Karbala teaches us a lot. It's all up to us how we take it. Which perspective do we see? Do we see tolerance? Do we see negotiations? Do we see democracy? Do we see uh, truthfulness? And do we see upholding of truthfulness? And how much do we implement it in our lives? Well, may God give us the capability and may God give us the ability to implement it in our daily lives as it's an institution. It has a lot to teach us. Thank you very much. Stay tuned to BTV World. Hussein no minni wa ana min al Hussein. Hussein no minni wa ana min al Hussein. Na ila ila Hussein hai, wa ta ila ila Hussein hai, wa ta ila ila Hussein hai. Farman Mustafa hai, ye qaul-e Rasul hai.